I want an open prompter. I'm gonna be reading. Yeah, yeah. Gonna open the script. Set the speed at 13. Gonna turn off the fan. Yeah, gotta turn off the fan. And close the window. Oh, oh, oh. From the Delta to the Falls, from the Grotto to the newly constructed Defense Ministry Building, nothing captures the rhythm of Equatorial Fredonia like Cadre cigarettes. Never a rough puff with Cadre, sponsors of the Committee Program. Live from West Berlin, it's the committee program with Julia Doubleday, Forrest Lovett, Fiamma Meli, Javad Cassati, and yours truly, Jacopo Castelletti. We now join the show backstage with Aran and Julia in Washington, D.C. You're talking about us? Well, because it's already, we're coming in, it's already recording. The whole thing's a nightmare because you, whatever the setup is here is, I mean, you know. Where's uh? See, you guys actually aren't being recorded. Only, only we are being recorded You're right on. now. So all of your jokes are not making it on the show. Oh, perfect. And all of uh, we are making it on the show. Well, you can keep talking. You know what I mean? But is the world listening? And the answer is no. Yeah. So look, we're ready for Chomsky. All the technical aspects are going to be perfect. Wait, we check the sound. We check the picture. We checked as if he has dogs. No dogs. Okay, I will expect to hear no dogs in that segment then. Okay, great, great. I'm glad we had this talk. It's about quality control. It's about quality control, and that's why I'm just talking over you, Javat, because I want this to be a good segment because we're not recording your audio, okay? All right, so ears up here, eyes up here. Be nice to Chomsky, okay? Well, no one's calling him Gnome, okay? All right, because that is, I don't know, you guys aren't all from America. Gnome is also like a small thing in the garden. It's not what we're good. Professor Chomsky. Professor Chomsky. He's in my personal space. Hi, and welcome to your committee program. I am your host, Arun Chaudhary. And look, if you follow the program, you know that we are grizzled veteran war horses of showbiz. You know that a lot of us came up in the vaudeville. You know that we have the grit, the gumption to put on a show. You know we have what it takes. So even though this week we are dealing with multiple catastrophes, well, uh, which, you know, we're having a major technical error in our deep cut segment, Riverside Dead FM, please do not break our hearts. We're also dealing with my absence. Uh, I am traveling in the United States working. Uh, many of you have been following along with that. Thank you for reaching out. But look, we're going to do what we do every week because that's what we do every week, which is put out a show. So, we're going to start out with the Global News Rodeo, move into some other segments, and look, thank you for being here. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be a good time. Forrest is going to be a good time. This is the Global News Rodeo with Arun Chowdhury and Forrest Lovett. Hi, and welcome to your Global News Rodeo, a roundup of world events as curated by the show's own Forrest Lovett. Let's go. Item one, in the eco-chamber, eco-fascism on the rise. And if you know anything about the program, you know that this is an issue we track a lot. Deutsche Welle is reporting on the greenwashing of the far right and growing eco-fascism. The latest massacre in Buffalo, New York, saw yet another radicalized white male target racial minorities while also writing a desperate and pathetic racist diatribe. In the writings, the shooter alluded to natural uh, conservation and degradation of the natural environment from mass migrations as his justification. This is similar to the writings of the shooters in 2019 Christchurch, New Zealand massacre, who labeled himself as an ethno-nationalist eco-fascist, and the 2019 El Paso, Texas massacre. Cassidy Thomas of Syracuse University says eco-fascists told Deutsche Welle, 
Ecofascists are tied up in racist theories and believe that the degradation of the natural environment leads to the degradation of their culture and their people. Far-right politicians are also shifting their alignments with the topic of climate change, moving away from outright denial. Politicians like Marine Le Pen in France embrace climate protection in her most recent presidential campaign, and the far-right AFD in Germany has stated they intend to embrace climate change as a recruiting tool. I mean, I, I just want to say two things about this. One, on the show, we talk about this a lot in terms of the fact that youth politics are not always left wing. And this is something that, you know, people sort of think based on their 20th century experiences, but we know that it's not so true. Uh, and the other thing is sort of how green, it's hard to know even what green parties' agendas can be because green uh, politics, even if it's not being enacted, has been adopted in the entire spectrum of parties. And so, uh, uh, when everyone is sort of saying the same thing, how does one define things as being different? I think you actually see this not only as a problem in terms of a, a way to boost far right, uh, far right uh, parties, but also as sort of confusion on the general center left and left coalitions about who's what people's roles are in things. That was confusing. That was not a good editorial, but we're going to slide into item two. Item two, NATO so fast, Turkey blocks Finland and Sweden membership. Politico Europe is reporting Turkish President Erdogan has doubled down on his objections to a NATO membership fast track for Finland and Sweden. Last Wednesday, the ambassadors of Finland and Sweden submitted their formal request to join the treaty organization. Following the request was a meeting of the North Atlantic Council, the governing political body of NATO, who were unable to reach unanimity because of the holdout by Ankara, meaning the accession process was halted. Erdogan addressed the council also declaring, today we are effectively one of the countries that gives the most support to the activities of this alliance. But this does not mean that we will unquestioningly say yes to every proposal brought before us. Turkish leaders criticize both member states of supporting Kurdish groups such as the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, which is classified as a terrorist organization by Ankara, although not by the committee program. Uh, we have always found that to be a bit of a sticky situation. And the other thing I will say is the fact that this is happening out in public and not behind closed doors shows that Turkey seems to really want to get the highest price that they can get for this. And that just sort of seems like an interesting thing to note in terms of negotiations inside NATO. Uh, when they people just want things, they ask you for them in closed doors. When people want things and they want to exact a toll on you by asking those things, that's when they make that ask public. So it's something to think about uh, if you're someone who likes to think about things like that. Item three, same old song and tragic dance, no investigation into journalists killing. Democracy Now! was reporting that the Israeli military will not open an investigation to death of Shireen Abu Akleh, a journalist for Al Jazeera. Witnesses say that Abu Akleh was killed by an Israeli soldier on May 11th while covering a raid in the town of Jenin in the occupied West Bank. I've actually been there. Uh, Al Jazeera is reporting the release of video which corroborates the story told by witness accounts. Filmed by a Janine resident, the film shows a quiet scene with no evidence of prior fighting, as was told by the Israeli military. Palestinian officials say they have retrieved the fatal bullet but will not hand it over to the Israeli military, as was requested, citing a lack of trust from previous experiences. That's putting it mildly. Israeli newspaper Haaretz reports that the Criminal Investigation Division of Military Beliefs treating Israeli soldiers as suspects will lead to opposition within the Society of Israel. <laughs> Item four, conservatives over down under, labor carries lead into election. And Forrest, good job. Good job. I'm glad to see you putting your university education to hard work in titles like that. That's working well. In fact, I'm, I'm even going to say it again. It was so good. Conservatives over, down under, Labour carries lead into election. The, the Guardian is reporting on the upcoming Australian general election. The Labour Party have held on to a shrinking lead in opinion polls before Saturday's election, but the party is weary of popping the champagne too soon, as the 2019 election loss and false prediction of a Labour victory continues to haunt them. Although Albanese and the, uh, Albanese and the Labour Party have promised to tackle the climate crisis by building more efficient transmission lines and reducing industrial emissions. Independent and Green Party candidates have enjoyed increased support and attention by offering a stronger climate action. As Australia faces a housing affordability crisis, uh, just quick aside editorial, housing is one of the number one polling issues everywhere. It's not, it's not just Australia uh, or Europe or the United States. It's everywhere. Um, 
As Australia faces a housing affordability crisis, labor has run on a platform of wage increases, adjacent, uh, addressing the gender wage gap, increasing manufacturing, and introducing a $392 million housing equity scheme. On the other side, incumbent prime minister and handsome rascal Scott Morrison and his government, the conservative liberal national coalition, are vying to disprove the election predictions once again and retain their parliamentary majority. And they might. These are survivors. And Scott Morrison is somehow the Teflon man down under. Although that isn't as good as when you did it in your title, Forrest. So I... So I don't know. Ciao and welcome back to our polling update here at the Polling Channel, brought to you by the Committee Program. Liberals and Labour are still locked in the land down under per essential report poll, with the Conservative Liberal Parts at 36 and the Liberal Labour Party at 35%. Looking at a margin of error system here, folks, let's keep an eye on it. In the Colombia presidential election, per TNSC poll, we have Petro, which runs from the left to the Greens at 43%, well ahead of the center-right to conservative Gutierrez. Mild and pleasant, thanks for the heads-up, America elects. Spain is looking tied up and messy weather-wise, with the socialist coming at 26.3%, with conservative PP eating them out at 28%. Vox comes in next at 16%, with Podemos coalition at 115 Nothing simple to gather here, except that we are in for a string of close and potentially messy coalition collisions. In Italy, Fratelli d'Italia continues to be number one party in the country. Good for them, but for us, they are, you know... Fascists! The center-left PD is still comparable with 21 and 20% respectively, Cinque Stelle and La Lega clock in next at around 15% each. Should the Brazilian election go to the second round, Comrade Lula is still leading at 54% to Bolsonaro's 45 This is very stable, but we have seen some softer numbers for Lula in other places, so let's all keep an eye out. Also, maybe Bolsonaro will get COVID again. He seems to, to enjoy it. Well, Paris Peps poll is not the COVID thing, the, the election. And from the staff here at the Polling Channel, thank you so much for watching and stay safe out there. for a committee afternoon. Hi, and welcome to a movie for a committee afternoon. This is actually not the segment I thought that we'll be running now. We thought we were gonna have a deep cuts, but that's okay because sometimes you have to think, what would Napoleon do? And what Napoleon would do is stay up all night and run around the back of the forest or whatever it is and attack the enemy from behind. And so that's what we're doing. And since the thing that we're suffering from is a lack of an audio track that we're waiting for, waiting for bated breath, again, Riverside.fm, do not break our hearts, waiting desperately for this, but we're actually gonna watch a film that has no soundtrack. We're gonna watch a silent film. And I think we're gonna to try to run some music underneath it, of course, to keep your head in the game. But we're gonna watch a very, very special film for several reasons. That film is Storm Over Asia by Padovkin. Padovkin is one of the great Soviet filmmakers. He is up with Eisenstein as being kind of a master of the montage. You'll certainly see why when we watch the film. And I think there's all kinds of reasons why well, we can say this is an interesting film for us to watch. One, this silent era of Soviet filmmaking is probably the high point of, I mean, we call it propaganda, but the high point of communicative film, like film that actually tells an advanced, complicated message through advanced film grammar. Like, you know, once sort of sound was added, even though not only in Hollywood, but also in the Soviet Union, there was kind of a regression of filmmaking into a more realistic, a more kind of theatrical production. And these films, these great films, 
highlight sort of pure, raw cinema communication. In this case, what's being communicated is the Soviet experience in Asia, and this is the third film in a trilogy that kind of chronicles the Bolshevik Revolution, you know, from its origins. There's a film called Mother to the fall of St. Petersburg and a film called The End of St. Petersburg. (laughs) And then uh, in this film called Storm Over Asia, that is about... Um, the Soviet friendship and liberation of Mongolia, although like it, it is slightly fictionalized in this case, um, the British are occupiers, which is a pretty safe bet for this part of the world, although people are occupying things, but actually that's not really the situation that was happening in Mongolia, so I do think that that is fair to say. Uh, but the film highlights you know, the friendship uh, um, that the Soviets are trying to build up in their you know, new state that does incorporate a lot of Asia and is an interesting film that mixes, you know, these fiction story elements with real documentary footage, some of which is just absolutely fascinating because it's a beautiful part of the world that we don't often get a real glimpse into, especially those of us uh, who are from North America. So let's watch the film, uh, Padovkin, 1928, Storm Over Asia. I'm gonna, we're gonna see what you all think. And I also want to say that it's cool, I think, to watch a Russian film in the way that in Listen to Britain, they listen to the German music because, like, I'm seeing a lot of weird cultural xenophobia on Russian stuff, and I I think that's weird, and I think that's not cool. So let's enjoy the film. Thank you. 
So that was cool, right? And uh, thank you for sticking with it. I know we are not kind of primed to watch silent movies. Um, and I often say that a peasant in the countryside of the Soviet Union in the early 30s kind of knew more about movies than we know now, simply because they were watching challenging material that made them sort of develop those muscles. Now, the point of movies are not to understand how to watch them. They're that they happen in a way that feels real to you. So you don't actually have to know how to watch them. It's sort of like being read to instead of learning how to read. Um, that actually is a good analogy. I like that. This is something we can make a whole article around this. I, I'm going to milk that for more. I'm going to milk that for more. I think you also see montage being used in different ways than Eisenstein does in this film. In a less kind of didactic way and in a way that is maybe more organic to character and more organic to what's happening on the screen to create a more seamless and less jarring experience that doesn't mean it's better or worse it means it's different and something about that i think has influenced not only um western cinema but also eastern cinema i think you can see in this film, not simply because it's taking place in Asia, not simply because it has some of the culture and rituals, etc., but you can actually see some of the techniques that will more be highlighted in kung fu movies coming to the fore here and some of the fight sequences, etc. I think it's really interesting, and I think it's good to draw lines between you know uh, cinemas other than Hollywood that are influenced by things other than Hollywood, right? Oftentimes we only talk about foreign film in terms of its difference or connection to Hollywood, but the world is multipolar in terms of its artistic output. And there are times when, you know, there are there's gonna be an artistic conversation between Russian filmmakers and Indian filmmakers that actually doesn't kind of involve the Hollywood paradigm. And this is, I think, one of those tensions we do see a film that is aimed at Eurasia. And so if you feel left out of the conversation, that's not an accident. Thanks so much for watching the committee program and bearing with us this week. We appreciate you so much. Committee. Committato. Committed. Committed. Karul. Committee. We're young, we submitting, we're committing. Thanks so much for tuning into the committee program. We know you have many options when it comes to content consumption, and we appreciate your attention to this new season with new episodes on Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and at 10 p.m. Central European Time. You can support the show by becoming a member on patreon.com slash the committee program. You can follow committee on Twitter, uh, backslash committee pro, on YouTube, the committee program, on Instagram, the committee program, on Facebook, the committee program, and you can visit the committee program company store at tpublic.com, the committee program shop. Special thanks, as always, to our team, Javad Castrati, Fiamma Melli, Jacopo Castelletti, Forrest Levette, and committee's deputy director, Julia Doubleday. Look alive out there. It's later than you think. It's the end of our broadcast day. Thanks for listening. program in our second series. For more global infotainment from the committee program click on the video screen right or screen left. Please like and subscribe to the committee program.
on Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern and 10 p.m. Central European Time.